talking to you all, dear brethren. There's little things in church history that uh, I think are very much worthy of our attention because we can draw incredible parallels from that history and because we find various things from that history indeed present even up to our own time. And uh, I brought to your attention the one of the most important prophecies ever uttered in the Bible. It's uttered in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, when the Apostle Peter rebuked the man who became the father of all Gnosticism and the total fall away of the uh, true individual, of the true God's church and many individuals within the church at the end of the first century. That's why you may find, let me remind you, the Gospel of John being different than other three synoptic Gospels, brethren, because the Gospel of John was written at the end of the first century. By the end of the first century when John died, he could have seen already the consequences of the falling away and the destructive influence of the uh, heresies promoted by Simon Magus. That's why in uh, some of his rec recording recorded messages, we find things that we don't find in other synoptic, uh, synoptic accounts, uh, in other synoptic uh, Gospels. For example, the, the encounter of Jesus Christ with the woman, Samaritan woman, at the well. You don't find it anywhere else but in the Gospel of John. And there is a good reason for it. Because John, at the end of the first century, was battling already the consequences of terrible prophesied falling away that happened in the true church. Sadly, there are people who always creep in among the saints and do things that are contrary to God's will. And then from time to time, God has to shake his, shake the trees. And uh, several years ago, I think I mentioned that even God even delivers his church, brethren. I'm not sure how many of you paid attention to what I said, but indeed, uh, the days of unleavened bread as well, as well as the Passover is coming up. So I'm reminded once again of something that I said several years ago. And one of those Individuals that whose influence is extant even to our day is indeed Simon Magus. Simon Magus was a major influence against the church in the first century, and his influence continued all the way through the reign of Constantine the Great in the fourth century and all the way into the fifth century through his followers, brethren. And that's what we have to understand. Simon Magus was so influential that Emperor Claudius, with the approval of the Roman Senate, erected a statue of Simon in Rome along the Tiber River with the inscription to Simon, the Holy God. Now, it was forbidden to erect any statue in honor of any person without the explicit approval of the Senate at, back in those days. And that means that Simon is not just a minor character that appeared in the book of Acts chapter 8 that we read about him. In a small backwater of the empire, but he was among the Roman pantheon of gods, brethren. He was right there in the very midst of the world uh, world capital at that time. Now, for someone this influential, one would expect to see some references to him or to his followers and to his teachings in the scriptures. This is, in fact, the case, but references to Simon's teachings are easy to miss if we do not know what they were. So in the next several Sabbaths, I would love to, in this pre-Passover season and generally, in uh, intriguing you with good facts from the Bible history, I would love to first delve into some of his background to see what sort of a person Simon, Simon Magus was. Then we need to go to what he taught. And finally, we need to examine references to Simon's teachings that appear in most of the books of the New Testament. Brethren, his references to his teachings are all over the New Testament, and most notably in the very last book of the New, of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. When we read about all of those Nicolaitans, and we read about those giving troubles to the churches, brethren, throughout the ages, it is obvious, it is so incredibly obvious that all of those teachings and all those troublemakers referring to Simon Magus and his followers. But we miss it, brethren, perhaps, if we don't know the history as we should. Now, Simon, as I mentioned already in one of the previous teachings, was born in a Samaritan village of Getai or Gita or Gital, however you want to pronounce it. He was the son of Antonius and Rachel. 
that's exactly what we find, and we find this in uh, Roberts, Roberts and Donaldson recognition of Clement, book chapter, uh, book uh, second and chapter seven about pseudo Clementine literature from the anti Nicene Fathers, well, volume eight. And I'll try to avoid all of these references anyway, because you'll find all of these things anyway by yourself if you just Google it out. Anyway, he was by profession a magician, which he learned in Alexandria, the Egyptian, famous Egyptian town. Alexandria was the main center of Gnosticism in, uh, in the world among, along with the Rome. Rome and Alexandria were the first cities, brethren if you wish, where the original followers of the true faith fell away from the truth and basically became the main leaders of Gnosticism. You might remember one of the uh, Jewish Gnostic uh, philosopher, very famous, Origen. He was from Alexandria, from the uh, from the Egyptian town of Alexandria. Now, uh, Simon Magus was the one who was schooled in magician, in magic, in Alexandria. But he didn't begin his self-promotion until after the death of John the Baptist, which happened sometimes in 28 uh, 28th year of our, of, of Anno Domini or, or AD. Now Simon was even referred to in some writings as a disciple of John the Baptist for a while. He was a very learned man and he was exceedingly well trained in Greek literature. And from the works attributed to Clement, the third bishop of Rome who died sometimes around 97 AD, so by the time when the Apostle John was battling against Gnosticism. Simon was desirous of glory and boasted above all the human race that he wished himself to be believed to be an exalted power. As we read, as you might remember in Acts chapter 8 verse 9, he was believed to be something extraordinary, something uh, something divine. And he wanted to be exalted, he uh, which is above God the Creator, and to be thought to be the Christ and to be called the Standing One. And he used this name as implying that he can never be dissolved, asserting that his flesh is so compacted by the power of his divinity that it can endure to eternity. And therefore he is called, brethren, the Standing One, as though he cannot fall by any corruption. Now this is all very interesting to know. These are all I'm summing it up from the various sources. And again, uh, I'm, I might just spare you from quoting exactly all the books and chapters and whatever. The point is to get the information of this person, brethren, because this person, Simon Magus, indeed might be the predecessor of the false prophet prophesied in Revelation 13, or perhaps even may have even some connections to the, well, I would not say to the first beast, it would be rather constant in the great, but this second beast in Revelation 13, the false prophet, with all of his magicians and all of his magic, he might be actually precursor to that. But most certainly he is the father of the church that to this day has been opposing the work of God. To this day has been attacking the church of God. To this day is the two-horned lamb. Two horns, horns, as you might remember from the book of Daniel, representing the powers, representing the powers. There is only one beast with two horns. It is called Vatican City, brethren. Vatican is at the same time a church hierarchy and at the same time a secular state. That is why all of our countries have got their ambassadors at Vatican, both the United States, Serbia and uh, all of other countries around the world. They've got ambassadors because Vatican is also the state as well as a church. That is a two-horned beast, speaking like a lamb, but actually spewing out the teachings of Satan. Brethren, the founder of that church, be not mistaken, is Simon Magus. Simon Magus and nobody else. As a magician, he was very much like James and Jambres, Pharaoh's magicians who opposed Moses. You might remember that those two are mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. Let's read them. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8. 2 Timothy, and I'll be reading, uh, well, from English Standard Version because uh, 
it's sometimes it's sometimes much easier to understand. Chapter two, verse eight, Second Timothy two eight. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, says uh, Apostle Paul in instruction to Timothy. And it is very important, brethren, because later of Timothy we read nothing in the Bible, which means that these who followed Simon Magus managed to squeeze him out of the organized church, brethren, for which I'm suffering bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound, says the apostle says the uh the apostle uh the apostle paul uh let me see where am i i should be did i say chapter two uh chapter three that is verse eight all right so chapter three verse eight uh if you hear the purring mind me not it's my one of my cats and he's very he's very unhappy that i was i was away and now he is in my lap and he's purring, so please don't mind the noise. And also my fans on my computer are making sometimes very strange noise. We don't understand exactly why, whether it's some interference, something to do with electricity, the electrical power, whatever the case might be. But just don't mind the noise, mind the message. Just, that's right, Second Timothy chapter, uh, let's go to chapter 3 verse 6. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Speaking of false Christians that creep, as you can see, brethren, creep into the households, creep into the church as well. Always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as James and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men who oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of of those two men. And so, basically, those were Pharaoh's magicians who opposed Moses. Just as James and Jambres, however you pronounce their names anyway, were able to duplicate some of Moses' miracles, brethren, so Simon was very powerful in magic, and Simon learned the black arts from similar sources in Egypt as James and Jambres. Uh, the Clementine homilies describe him as follows. I'm quoting now from those homilies. It says, Simon disciplined himself greatly in Alexandria, the Egyptian town, and being very powerful in magic and being ambitious, wished to be accounted a certain supreme power, greater even than the God who created the world. And sometimes, intimating that he is Christ, he styles himself the standing one. And this epithet he employs, intimating that he shall always stand, and have no cause of corruption that would cause his body to fall. He says that God who created the world is not supreme, and he does not believe that the dead will be raised. He rejects Jerusalem and substitutes Mount Gerizim for it. Remember in John chapter 4, verse 20 to 23, that's exactly the encounter of Jesus Christ and the woman at the well. And the woman says, well, how come, well, our, our father Jacob prayed that this Mount Gerizim false brethren and then of course jesus christ re, uh, corrects her and says well the time is coming when my followers the true followers the true true believers in christ will be praying in the truth and in spirit instead of our christ simon magus he proclaimed himself isn't that interesting also the clement of rome uh who was uh ruling towards the end of the first century, Clement of Rome described some of Simon's miracles, miracles under quotation mark as follows. He makes statues walk, and he rolls himself on the fire, and is not burned, and sometimes he flies. He makes loaves of bread out of stones. He becomes a serpent. He transforms himself into a goat. He becomes two-faced. Well, brother, I'm telling you this because it might be happening in our time, before our very eyes. He changes himself into gold. He opens locked gates. He melts iron. At banquets, he produces images of all manner of forms. In his house, he makes dishes be seen as born of themselves to wait upon him, no bearers being seen. I wondered when I heard him speak thus, but many bore witness that they had been present and had such seen such things. Now, brethren, the Apostle Peter stated those are useless signs which you say that Simon did. That's historical record. But I say 
that the making statues walk and rolling himself on burning coals and becoming a dragon and being changed into a goat and flying in the air and all such things not being for the healing of men are of nature to deceive many. And Jesus Christ prophesied, brethren, that many will be deceived by false miracles and false Christians. But the miracles of a compassionate truth are philanthropic, such as you have heard that the Lord did, such as being freed from all kinds of diseases and from demons, some having their hands restored and some their feet, some recovering their eyesight and some their hearing. And of that. John Cassian, the 4th century, classified healing into three different classes where Simon's miracles, so-called miracles, if they can be called such, are of the third class. <laughs> and this is how he classified them. The first class is indeed for the sake of healing when the grace of science accompanies certain elect and righteous men on account of the merits of their holiness. For example, uh, we have so many of those uh, 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 of those examples in the scriptures. And so, for example, uh, let's see that the text has, has now has, has escaped me. Where is the example? All right, the example will be here. For example, the Lord said, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the devils. Freely you have received, freely you give. This is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Now, the second class is for the edification of the church and proceeds from either the faith of those who bring the sick or from those who are to be cured. The virtue of health proceeds even from sinners and men unworthy of it, of whom the Savior says, Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name cast out the devils, and in your name done many mighty work. And then I'll confess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you workers of iniquity. This is from Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Now, if the faith of those who bring the sick, or if the sick, if the faith of the sick is lacking, it prevents those on whom the gift of healing are conferred from receiving the healing. For example, Mark said in Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, and Jesus could not do any mighty works there because of their unbelief. The Lord himself says, Luke chapter 4, verse 27, Many lepers were in Israel in the days of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed but Naaman the Syrian. Naaman the Syrian. And the third class of healing is copied by the deceit and contrivance of devils. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So, brethren, yes, even some healings are not miracles of God. They are miracles of the devils. When a man who is enslaved to evident sin is out of admiration for his miracles, regarded as a saint and a servant of God, men may be persuaded to copy his sins. Thus, an opening is made for trivializing, and the sanctity of religion may be brought into disgrace. Or else, he who believes that he possesses the gift of healing may be puffed up by pride of heart, and so fall more grievously. Hence, it is when the names are invoked of those who, as they know, have no merits of holiness or any spiritual fruits, they, the devils, pretend that by their merits they are disturbed and made to flee from the bodies they have possessed. Of which it says in Deuteronomy, if there rise up in the midst of you a prophet or one who says he has a dream and declares a sign and a wonder and that which he has spoken comes to pass and he says to you, let us go and follow after other gods whom you do not know, and let us serve them, you shall not hear the words of that prophet or of that dreamer, for the Lord your God is tempting you that it may appear whether you love him or not with all your heart and with all your soul. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 1 through 3. And in the gospel it says in Matthew 24, 24, uh, 24, 24 there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall give great signs and wonders, so that if it were possible, even the elect should be led astray. Brethren, this is a serious warning, and uh, again, it happened in the history of God's church, many were led astray. Not only that they were led astray, but but in the 2nd century, when the uh, curtain was lifted upon what used to be the apostolic church, we had seen, we had, be, we had beheld something totally different. A church described in Revelation 17 
as the harlot, a church practicing totally different doctrines, a church pretending to be a Christian church, but actually being the great spiritual harlot. The apostasy, if you wish, brethren. The apostasy. And I feel that we have to be educated about this because there will be various temptations, lures, whatever, to draw us away from God and that we apostate or that we proclaim as great leaders, great evangelists, great preachers, you name it, those whose fruits are actually not of God and they're not Christian fruits. This afternoon I I came from the Serbian sermon very much fired up, I have to tell you, because last Sabbath I began the uh, question, why do we have fiery trials? And that's the same topic I'll bring to you at some point before the Passover. The fiery trials, why do we have them? And brethren, I had to explain to the public in Serbian, to the audience in Serbian, that whether we obey God or not, trials and temptations are there. Because God says through many tribulation we have to enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus Christ said, in the world you'll have tribulations, but do not worry, I have overcome the world. Now, the Serbian members go through various problems, persecutions, uh, lack of physical necessities, uh, lack of freedom, personal trials, etc., etc. And they all, at times, we all wonder why, why do we have these trials? And when will this come, when will this come to an end? Well, the trials are there, brethren. God designed our life, Christian lives, to be like that so that we build something that we have to build and it's called the immutable, eternal, God-like, if you want, or Christ-like character. Brethren, character is the point. But I'm not sure that many people get it even to these days. Mr. Armstrong was, towards the end of his life, pounding that, brethren, pounding on his last Pentecost message, telling people what is the purpose of the church. And he uttered an amazing sentence while he was there in the in the, the in the uh, headquarters in Pasadena. And half of you here sitting don't get it. He was wrong, brethren. More than half didn't get it. So many people in the first century didn't get it when the Gnosticism, so much alike the true Bible religion, engulfed the original church. Because they were infested by Simon Magus' followers, brethren. And let me tell you the secret. You read about them in the book of Revelation, all those Nicolaitans, Balaamites, all of those various things, brethren, those are all the different names for Simon Magus and his followers, but perhaps we never recognize that because we don't even know who Simon Magus is. And we don't even know that he's the founder of this big, huge harlot posing itself, palming it off as a Christian church, but it's actually <laughs> anything but Christian, you know. Brethren, in our preaching of the gospel, and I, this is not per se the topic for today, but this is so important. This is so important because Mr. Armstrong felt towards the end of his life that Protestantism has so much engulfed our understanding. Brethren, we are in the true church of God. The true church of God is not even the name of the organization. The true church of God is a spiritual organism composed of people who properly repented turned away from sin, got baptized as it is written in the Bible, and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they're being led by the Holy Spirit. That is the true church of God. Wherever it might be, whoever it might be part of it, God is the one who chooses and places people in that body. But brethren, it seems in our day and age, with so many fractions and factions out there, with so many divisions... I guess the World World Cup was uh, an excellent illustration of divisions among, among humanity. And so people operate like that, you know. We belong, we, we, we support different football teams, we support different this and the others. And you may say, brethren, we support different churches. Yes, indeed. 
and so that the Serbian public would not have this wrong impression. We are not preaching the gospel so that we will be will be uh, having matches against different churches and we will be showing the different churches how superior we are. Brethren, the different churches battle Jesus Christ himself and his own, his, 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 his doctrine. And the other churches are going to be, to be indeed defeated along with the rest of human, humanity when Jesus Christ comes back. We are part of the true church, brethren. Not because we battle with other churches, we have no need for that. We are part of the true church so that through all those many trials and tribulations, we will be developing Developing character, brethren, character, Christ-like character. That's why we have all these tests and trials. And more is probably coming. And more is to be expected. And like we heard in the opening prayer, the more difficult times that are ahead of us. Yes, indeed. We are to finally understand one crucial thing. That without God-like, Christ-like character, none of us is going to make it into the kingdom, brethren. None of us. And God didn't call us so that we will be battling, uh, having battles with other churches and show them how superior we are. Ho oh, oh. And I, I, I pointed it out because the Serbian mental, mental, uh, mindset, Serbian mindset is like that. Oh, let's show how superior we are. Let's show to the other football team. Let's show to the other nation how superior we are. Let's show to this that our enemies how wonderful and tough we are. We are Serbs. Yeah. We are unconquerable. Wrong, 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 wrong. So I explained to the Serbian public today that we are part of the true church because God called us to overcome ourselves. And that we become Christ-like and God-like people that will very soon will be having our own share in the kingdom of God as co-workers and co in uh, co-rulers and co-owners of the whole universe so that we can lead all of these warring nations in our region into the peace, final peace, and we can lead them into, into salvation. And brethren, the same is true when it comes to each one of you. So we're not part of the true church so that we will be showing how superior we are to the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show them, flex our muscles at them and show them. Look how mighty we are. Look what a wonderful dreams we had. Look what a numbers we have. Look what we have, this, that, and the other. No, brethren, no, 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 and no. Get rid of this competitive mindset. Yes, the word competition, competitiveness is one of the sacred words in your culture, brethren, and I know that. Competitive market, competitive labor force, competition, uh, multiple choice, compete, 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 compete. Brethren, we as God's people are not competing with anyone. We are only possibly competing with our rotten human natures that don't want to die. And many, I'm afraid, in our midst don't get it. Your human nature and my human nature doesn't want to die. He wants to live. He wants to continue to produce its fruits of death, brethren. Get it. And those old men and women that you buried at baptism... Sometimes they just want to get resurrected, right? Right. And get control over your life. So you have to grab whatever and you have to push them back into that watery grave. Yes, I know it. It's part of Christian life. Because our human nature wants to compete with God's truly nature and God's spirit and wants to overtake us, brethren, take us over and make us again miserable, pitiable and suspect to eternal death. No, we don't want it. We are not part of God's church, so we can compete with other churches. Forget about that. That's a wrong mindset. We are part of God's church because God has called us to preach the gospel, but also not only that. The work of God, brethren, is not like preaching the gospel. It's an integral part in our spiritual character growth. Yes, indeed. But God has called you and me to change us from what we were miserable sinners worth worth nothing and we're still worth nothing so that he can build in us immutable eternal god like character that's the point and we need to understand that we are on a mission of building christ like character it's usually built under pressure 
We all came to this world under pressure, brethren. With strains. All of you mothers, just remember how you brought these, your children to this world. And yes, we have pressure and strains. Now, in this time, in this day, in this age. Why? Because God is chastising us. We are not bastards, spiritually speaking. We are His children and He chastises every child He loves. Why? With the purpose that the loving eternal God will share with us His eternity. That's why, brethren. And there is no eternity without God-like character. But that, it seems to me, something that is being so much neglected in the Church of God worldwide movement. Oh, look who wonderful speakers we have. Oh, look, we've got this, that, and the other. Enough of that competition. It's wrong, it's stupid, it's dumb. There is nothing we can we can boast before God, brethren, other than what God has done in our lives. That's exactly what He needs. We have to leave the space for the Holy Spirit in us. It's not enough to have it. You have to let it work in you and build Christ-like character in you, brethren. The most difficult thing in the world is to build a character. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes lifetime. And why we analyze now Simon Magus? Well, brethren, we analyze not because we're competing with other churches at the church that he founded. We're analyzing Simon Magus so that you would know where are your other enemies are going to come at so that you would know that it's nothing new under heaven, that you know that it happened to Christians in the first century as well. Can you imagine a man like this walking around this town and performing these tremendous miracles I've just read from the historical sources, Brendan? Can you imagine? Well, you should, because it's going to happen probably before our eyes. And the whole world, it says in Revelation, the whole world worshipped the first beast and was saying, who is mighty to war with him? But the whole world, if you notice, worshipped the second beast as well. And the second beast was mesmerizing the whole world with all of its hippity hoppity hoop, you know, hocus pocus paper and the stuff. Brethren, the whole world will be just mesmerized. Just imagine the pressure on us. Oh, how can you say that such a holy person is actually under Satan's influence? Well, I can say it because it says in the Bible. And because it's God's revelation to us, brethren. But the pressure is coming. The societal pressure is even more amazing. And it will be even a stranger to all those of you who have lived in a society where the freedom of religion, expression, uh, you name it, is guaranteed. And not only guaranteed, but it is respected. Respected in reality. Oh yes, we have freedom of expression in Serbian constitution. We have freedom of religion in Serbian constitution, brethren. But it's all formality. In reality, it's a different story. In Africa, it's a different story as well. You know. There's a great pressure from witch doctors and witchcraft all over the place and black magic all over the place. And sadly, some people are not able to leave that spiritually speaking forever and allow Jesus Christ to work in their lives and create in them a perfect, immutable, eternal character. Brethren, character! If there is one word I want you to focus on in this pre-Passover season is character. Simon Magus was perverted character other than, other than performing false miracles. But brethren, another Simon Magus, so to speak, might come up there again. I watch the Midnight Mass, Christmas Mass, every every single Christmas and Easter. I just watch. I observe Vatican because I'm 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 trying to find out what is so abominable that God calls their abomination. I wasn't Catholic. I had no. I didn't go to all of those rituals when I was younger. So I just kind of tune into Vatican just just to see. What is that God calls abomination? Brethren, the present Pope is very ill. He was yawning all the time. He could barely follow the, the, the proceedings. And he was being pushed in a wheelchair around because he couldn't really walk. He is exhausted and we don't know who is the next one. Perhaps he's the next one who will be like this Simon Magus. But whoever it will be, we know that the one, the second beast coming in the second, uh, coming, uh, prophesied in, uh, book of Revelation chapter 13, is coming! 
and with him there will be a tremendous societal pressure, especially because we'll live in this ecumenical age, when all the nominal Christians are supposedly united because they all believe in Holy Trinity and because all believe in the same Lord Jesus Christ, false Jesus Christ. And that brethren, you have to be able to discern what is false and what is not, brethren. And a great help in that is history because history is a teacher of life. That's one saying here in Europe. Teacher in your life. Because what happened, and we know from the Bible what happened, will happen again on even greater scale. But please, as a part of your Christ-like walk, please understand one thing. We are not part of the true church so that we can flex muscles at others' churches and show them how superior we are. No, brethren. We may have even more trials than other people. We may have even more tribulations than other people. We certainly have persecutions that other people do not face. And if you wonder, if you wonder why, that's because God allows that because He has ordained us to live that way, that life. Why? So that He can correct us and mold us and shape us and build our character. Rendering character, that's what it is. But of course the Protestants don't get it. To them it's just, you know, to win the world for Christ against Satan. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that in various circles of the Church of God, as a spiritual movement, there is this kind of, there is this kind of mentality. Oh, we are here in the true church. Let's just show these others who we are and what we can be. Brethren, that's not what God called us for. Yes, He called us to preach the good news, but He called us that the work of God is to bring in us, create in us incredible what potential we have. Incredible human potential. I'm not sure if you have ever read that book, but you should. Among other good quality literature that we have, uh, from the past, that book is excellent. It shows the incredible human potential to become part of God's family. But in order to be that, we have to have character being built, and as the book points out, that is not done overnight. It takes time and experience. Very unpleasant experience sometimes. And it takes pressure if you want. Gold and silver, brethren, are precious stones. We are uh, compared to those stones in the Bible. But you know, the dross and impurities from gold and silver before they're put into the uh, 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 models so that before they are molded into jewels it asks for tremendous heat and pressure there used to be a rock song I think some of you probably know it it's called Under Pressure I think it was very popular a few years ago but under pressure that's what Christians are constantly under pressure sometimes that pressure sadly comes from within like it happened in the first century when, when, when swarms of Gnostics, Simon Magus followers, entered into the church. It happened also in the 4th century when the church opened up its gates for the pagans to become Christians under the, under the, uh, under the orchestration of, 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 of Constantine the Great. Brethren, we are living now in the ecumenical age. Everything is accepted. Everything is nice. All the Christians love one another. Can you imagine? Only those few heretics there, you know, just don't, they're just messing up our unity because they don't like us. They preach these strange doctrines. They keep the Sabbath and the holidays and they don't keep our holy Sunday and they go go to our mass. Brethren, the pressure is there. It will be there. That we are not in the church of God so that we can flex muscles and show others how superior we are. We are here to have, to have under pressure the building of Christ-like character. The most, the most difficult thing in the world. And perhaps I would dare to say the most painful thing in the world. Because this world is anything but Christ-like. But get used to it. Get it, that, get it in your mind. And keep in mind one thing, without that God-like character, Christ-like character, none of us will make it into the kingdom. None of us, brethren. We're not competing with other churches, we're not in competition with them. Yes, we decry their wrong theological systems, 
because it's wrong, it's anti-biblical, but we are not competing with them. And we're not just like one of those churches out there preaching something, unique doctrines and being unique. No. No, of course not. But I'm afraid with many people, I'm not sure sometimes, you know, sometimes the problem that we have is that we have, uh, the, the Serbian congregation brought it up, up, up today, the lack of communication. We don't even know one another, they would say. And the question is, we're a spiritual family. Well, how can we be a spiritual family? Usually all the problems you'll bring before your family. But whom to bring if we don't know some people? In the past, there was always a complaint, and rightly so. We never hear of those, how many thousands of members in Africa, whatever. And it's true. We don't, because there's never feedback. And always my concern was always, what are those people being taught back there? You know, being, all that we hear from them, need for churches to be built, need for buildings to be built. Really? The numbers are rising. The open door. Fine. Fine, but what is being taught to those people, brethren, is always my, has always been my concern. And I never know it because there is never feedback. There is always a mystery when it comes to that part of the world. But that's their choice. I wonder, does somebody teach them about the necessity of Christ-like character? Because by the fruits of some of them, I have, or many of them, I haven't seen that in action, to be honest with you, brethren. And I've said to the Serbian congregation many times, brethren, if we're going to be just like the rest of the world, God may just allow us to all die out before the kingdom, because we will be a shame to the kingdom of God. And I'm telling the same that the same to you, brethren, and I've said it to everybody else. We have to be mindful of the character and the need for having Christ-like character in us if we want to make it into the kingdom. Simon Magus was opposed to those who had Christ-like character back in his days. Now, Justin Martyr, who was from Samaria, he referred to Simon Magus' magic and influence as being very prominent in the first century, brethren. Simon was not some obscure sorcerer operating in one remote corner of the Roman Empire. Oh no. He had the favor of the emperor, Claudius, and Claudius reigned sometimes in the middle of the first century, and uh, my, Simon Magus could have preeminence wherever he chose. In addressing the emperor in one of his, uh, one of his writings, first apology in the book 26, Justin, Justin Martyr states this, he wrote this to Emperor in the second century. He says he was he was bemoaning, if you wish, or whatever other would be the appropriate description of feeling, bemoaning the fact that Simon Magus gained such a prominence in Rome among the Romans. To the point that a public statue in his honor was pub- placed publicly between the two bridges over the Tiberius River, and that was something that was strictly forbidden unless the Senate the Senate would approve it and give his authorization for something like that. And here is what Justin Martin writes in his first apology. After Christ's ascension into heaven, the devils put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods. Oh, oh. isn't there a man on the face of the earth today claiming the same? Vicarius Philidae, the son of God? Yes, brethren. He's in a wheelchair right now, but anyway, he's got his line of successors and line of predecessors. <laughs> and then Justin Markin continues, there was a Samaritan, Simon, a native of the village called Gito, who in the reign of Claudius Caesar and in your royal city of Rome did mighty acts of magic by virtue of the art of the devils operating in him. I wonder how many people in the second century when they read this from uh, Justin Martin really understood what he said. Brethren, I wonder how many of us will understand in our 21st century when somebody like Simon Magus appears, how many of us will understand the driving force behind that person? He was considered, uh, continues Justin Martin, a god, with capital G, by the way, brethren, considered a god, and as a god with capital G, 
was honored by you with a statue, which statue was erected on the river Tiber between the two bridges and bore this inscription in the language of Rome, Simone Dei Sancto, to Simon the Holy God. End of the quote. How tragic. And I have to remind you, brethren, that it was the congregation addressed by the Apostle Paul who wrote the letter to Romans. It was that congregation, brethren, very that congregation that fell away from the truth and fell for the traps of the devil whose instrument was Simon Magus. Now this is how serious it is because we have to understand. We need to understand. And church always thought that, brethren, but I always wonder how much people really understood it because we live in this wishy-washy, nice age, everything is relative, you know, everything is accepted. Oh, we're all Christians. When I was in Latin America in Salvador, oh, Mr. Vedic, what do you believe? The Pope came there, and I happened to be there, that will be the February the 12th, uh, 1996, that's right. Uh, the late Pope uh, John Paul II, John Paul II came to visit Salvador and Guatemala. Now he was greatly stirred because at one point what happened in Guatemala was the first time in the history of that beautiful country with eternal spring. Beautiful country, brethren. Uh, a perfect climate. People very kind of nice and humble. Beautiful country. Full of that wildlife. On Friday night you just w- walk outside the, the, the house and you just hear from various directions. You hear the the, the 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 people singing glory, singing on Friday night. Whether they kept Sabbath or whether they kept Sunday, I don't know. Whether they kept the whole weekend, I've got no idea. The people singing to God. I've never he I've never experienced that anywhere in the world, but in Guatemala, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I tell you. And I have so many fond memories, even of the Christians there, and also of of the so many fond memories of the country itself. Interesting enough, my country has no diplomatic relations with Guatemala. But interesting enough, Guatemala does has, on various numerous occasions, said to Serbia that it does respect its uh, its uh, sovereignty and its territorial integrity. In other words, it doesn't doesn't recognize the self-proclaimed Kosovo province as a false state. But that's aside, a comment, the, the beautiful Guatemala, you could hear Friday night and then you can hear from all the directions all of a sudden guitar music and then you hear this in Spanish, Alabare, 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 Adios, Si Señor, Alabare, I'll praise, I'll praise, I'll praise my God, yes God and so on. It was very Protestantish, but nevertheless it was nice to hear on Friday night because it was eternal spring, so outside was very pleasant nature and I experienced that in Guatemala. But the Pope was stirred because for the first time in the history of Guatemala, the number of Protestants outnumbered the number of Catholics in Guatemala. So he was prompted to visit Guatemala. On his way to Guatemala, of course, he would visit El Salvador. And I'm saying all of this because that was a big event. You know, El Salvador is a small nation. Much smaller than Guatemala anyway, but with a staunch, staunch Catholic majority. Staunch Catholic majority and plenty of other Protestants who were there, uh, belonging to various other, uh, other groups and even one group called the Church of Israelites. Would you believe that, brethren? Because I'm very fond of the House of Israel, as you know, and I keep preaching that truth all the time, everywhere to anyone, because that's the pivotal truth of the Bible. Anyway, there was the church called the Israelites. Now, of course, they, of course, equate Israelites with the state of Israel, so they would usually flaunt the uh, flags of Israel and, and, and so on. But obviously, there is some presence of people who feel some attachment to, everywhere you find attachment to the Jews, is the same blood seeking its own blood, brethren. Is the Israelites seeking the, the, the other part of the family? And anytime you find some kind of strange, inexplicable attachment to the Jewish people, you know that it must be something to do with their identity or their ancestry. When you go to Africa in the deepest countryside and you hear people greeting themselves with Shalom, Shalom, they have no idea what it means, then you know something must be there. Something must be there in their past. Something must be there in their tradition that has preserved that Shalom, Shalom 
because Bedouin doesn't make any sense. That the preacher named Ezekiel con- uh, greets his congregation with Shalom Shalom and they respond Shalom Shalom even without knowing what it means. Shalom Shalom, yes. Still very famous Jewish greetings. Everybody knows that, that the Jews to this day greet each other with Shalom. Meaning peace, peace to you. Shabbat Shalom, the famous greetings, brethren, for the Jewish people that even many of us have, have adopted because it's so beautiful. Peaceful Sabbath. Filled with Shalom, with peace. And what more can you wish to others than to wish them peace, peace of mind, and so on and so forth? In any case, there was the Pope. There were just zillions of people on the street, on the main street of Salvador, chanting to him, waving the flags of Salvador and, 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 and Vatican, chanting, in Spanish it does rhyme, Juan Pablo II te quiere todo el mundo. To this day I remember that. To this day I can hear the crowds singing, John Paul II, the whole world loves me. It's not true, of course. <laughs> of course, the true Christians, there are still hopefully many or some do not love him. But anyway, that was being chanted that he was greeted like, like the son of God. Papa Mobile, that was the first time I've seen the Papa Mobile. He came very, he came very close to me, to where I was standing on the main street. No, he didn't perform any miracles at that time, Brendan, but he could have. And one of these days, it's not excluded that he will. And who is going to convince crowds of people worshipping him that that's from the devil? Who? Nobody, brethren. We're not competing with the world. We're not competing with these churches, brethren. It's the pressure on us. Because we will know the truth. You shall know the truth. Little truth uh, makes, uh, it says in Serbian, in the Proverbs, it says, makes some uh, little affliction. And brethren, we have much truth. And it seems as time goes on, we have more and more truth. Well, if little truth creates affliction, just imagine how much more truth, big truth, how much, how much abundance of truth can create in us. But pressure, brethren, will be there. Be ready for it. Be ready to be labeled to be heretics. And those who disturb the world peace and the enemies of your state. Did you hear what I said? The enemies of your state. Yes, brethren. You know, it's not easy, but uh, I have to mention this. I have to mention this because I was so excited during the New Year's days, around New Year's Eve and so on, this Roman, Roman calendar year. The Serbian national television showed the movie Edward Snowden. Oh, you know that name very much, don't you? I was so excited, the national, my national television is going to show this movie. I heard of Edward Snowden, of course, that I did, just like the rest of you, but I had no idea about the details. Details of his life, details of his biography and stuff. So I was so excited because my friends from the States and Australia phoned me and we were just chatting. Uh, and I said, look, in an hour, there'll be Edward Snowden movie on our national TV. I have got to watch it. But brethren, what a tragic story of a young man who didn't want to live lies. That's the world in which we live, brethren, full of lies. A young man who discovers that his own government, now interestingly enough, the government at that time, the tenure, it was when uh, Barack Obama was in power. He discovers that his government can tap and listen to every mobile phone. He discovers pyramid, no, no, it's not pyramid, it's prism, prism program through which the U.S. government was tapping and listening to your Skype conversations. I've been telling you ever since I know you, forget about privacy, forget about that God of yours. There is no privacy when you're a Christian, brethren. There is no privacy. None of us has got any privacy. We're constantly under surveillance. We're constantly under pressure. Prism, now I know, is the program that your government used to listen to me and to you. And not only Skype, but they listen to everything else. And this young man discovered that. And he sacrificed everything for the sake of some kind of justice that he felt. 
So he goes to uh, to uh, no the Hong Kong. That's right. He, according to the movie, he invites the uh, the, the several several journalists, British and American, to tell them of this secret things of these evil people, such as people as this World Economic Forum with this terrible people there who are just playing like the New World Government. And he's going to, he wanted to warn the world, Edward Snowden to warn, warn the world what kind of lunatics we are having over us in power. Because he was afraid somebody's going to push the button, nuclear button and do more damage to the world. What a movie, brethren! What a movie! And I watched it, you know, I usually don't watch TV, but I had to watch this movie. I wanted to see who is this man who stood up against the whole world. Who was under terrible pressure. <coughs> but then at the end of the movie, he's having an interview, internet interview, with somebody, a Russian announcer, speaker, and then, you know, he, he asked him about the freedom, what he sacrificed, whatever. And then you see the crowds of people with standing ovation. And I myself could not, I was just, Clapping as well. Sitting here by myself in this room, brethren, because one young man dared to stand up against his government, to stand up against his nation, to stand up against the whole world. For the sake of the truth that he discovered. And God called us, discovered us all the truth and discovered all of these various lies that are being promoted by the instruments of Satan. But in the church always said that there are religious or political and political and religious or secular instruments of Satan. How many do of us do understand that, brethren? Religious, of course, nominal Christianity now being formed into ecumenism, ecumenical movement, and political, brethren, political, uh, 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 political uh, instruments of Satan informed, embodied in our governments in government's various programs, in government's control over us. So if you wished to know who actually endangered your privacy and privacy of the rest of the world, it was Barack Obama and his administration and it was a program called PRISM that was tapping us and listening to our conversations. Great, hopefully. We set up a good example and hopefully they've learned something from us. But we're being surveilled all the time. We're like the sheep for slaughter all day long, says the, says the King David in his psalm. Brethren, do we get it? Do we understand it? Do we get it? The pressure, societal pressure is coming upon us. Are we going to cave in? when the relatives and friends would say, please don't go, don't go to the Middle East, don't go to that place of safety, somebody's going to poison you there. Please don't do this. Please be with us here at home. Brethren, pressure will be tremendous. How many of you, how many of us will be able to sustain it? I don't know. But I feel, I feel it is my duty as your elder to warn you about it. And to tell you about it in advance. So hopefully when it happens, you will see, you will say, okay, we were warned in advance. We must not cave into this pressure. Irenaeus, another of church fathers in the middle of second century, stated that Peter had some unusually keen insight into Simon Magus' motives when Simon tried to purchase the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is a quote now against heresies from Irenaeus. This is book number one. And it is uh, chapter 23. This Simon, who pretended faith. Oh, brethren, their life of fools pretenses. Many false Christs have gone into, out into the world, says the Apostle John at the end of the first century in his first epistle. Brethren, the same might be the case now. And some of those people, be not you mistaken, may try to find their ways into the ranks of the true church in order to advance in the true church. 
And it happened even in the 1974, Mr. Armstrong was forced to read, to write an article. Now God speaks to you ministers. I've got that article here. And because now I'm part of the, of the ministry in a sense, I keep, I pay close attention to what he had to say to the ministry, to what the Bible has to say to the ministry, and to what kind of abuse of power ministers can do, brethren, when they're not in tune with God. In 1974, Mr. Ramsey writes, Are you aware, brethren, that all of our evangelists have left the church? What if the evangelists left the church? What can happen to us, other common members, you might say, lay members, whatever? And of course, Satan will always attack the, 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 the leadership, certainly. If he can confuse the leadership, then he can confuse the rest of the, the rest of the flock. Well, indeed. Well, indeed. In the first century, he attacked the ministry through all of these Simon Magus followers who crept in into the church, took over the visible organizations and became the preachers, became like that Diotrephes that we mentioned several Sabbaths ago. So this Simon, writes Irenaeus, who pretended faith, supposed that the apostles themselves performed their cures by the art of magic and not by the power of God. With respect to their filling with the Holy Spirit, though the laying on of hands, Simon suspected that even this was done through a kind of greater knowledge of magic. <laughs> Look at this level of deception, brethren. But yes, those deceivers, as I said to you, may find, and it happened to us in the past, may find their, 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 their way into the true church, warm themselves into the true church. That's why the... uh Verse we often quote that we are to contend earnestly for the faith once for all given to the saints. There is immediately warning from the same apostle saying because some people have crept in unawares. And I can continue to describe the character of those deprived people and to say that their faith has been long waiting for them anyway. And compares them to uh, waterless clouds in Serbian. That's at least Serbian translation. To the trees twice pulled up and things like that. Brethren, I'm telling you this because I don't want that any of us would end up like that. But it is a danger because Satan goes around like a roaring lion. He's not looking for the government. He's not looking for your president. Or my president. He's not looking for your neighbors. He's not looking for your relatives. He's not looking for your nation. He keep, he holds them all under control. And he offered all of that to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ would just bow to him. Bow to me. I'll give you all of these kingdoms. Jesus Christ didn't deny that Satan is currently ruling all those kingdoms. Brethren, Satan is after us. Satan is after us. If he could pervert our character, if he could just influence our mind, if he could make us all to be Simon Magus followers, oh, he would be having a heyday. Like he succeeded towards the end of the last century when he basically got to the main top people in Pasadena. And now he's having a heyday seeing all these various divisions and seeing all this competition between various even groups of the churches of God, we are not into that competition again, as I said, but you know, we must get it out of our, out of our minds. I do appreciate your capitalism as an economic system, but it's one thing, and spirituality is something else. God hates competition. God wants humble people who look to Him not to people who pretended, pretend faith like, you know, like Simon Magus. Oh, I'm a Christian, but in the meantime, he was doing the arts of magic and, and, and performing false miracles. We're being exposed constantly to the false Christianity, brethren, and it's going to be our enemy to the very end. And the pressure on us, on our so-called Christian societies, will be ever increasing. Please be getting ready for that. It's psychological, it's terrible. I think somewhere psychologists have even discovered that this kind of mental pressure is far more excruciatingly painful and far worse and far more painful than even the physical torture, brethren, 
if that's the case, to think about it. None of us have been, thankfully, tortured because of the faith. None of us have been burned at stake like Polycarp was. None of us was burned on the, at stake like, 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 like Christians in Nero's time. And that persecution by Nero, by the way, just basically crippled that church, murdered many pillars in the church, and made that church so weak that it, at the end it just became what it is today. And what it displays today to the whole world over its all of its channels. Oh, it's amazing, brethren. The deception, the level of deception, the subtlety is just incredible. If you wouldn't have TV, but if you have a if you have a radio set, all you can do through the wavelength, you can just tune into Radio Vatican when they have midnight mass, for example. You wouldn't believe not a one single crack, not a one single noise. It's almost like you know another cat to be purring happily, <laughs> and probably he's very he's very amazed. Why am I raising my voice? But I am because, brethren, that's Mr. Armstrong. We used to say, "Forgive me for this. This is might be this might be his prejudice." But he said, "With Americans, I have to raise my voice because they only listen to you when you shout at them." And he had a totally different approach in Britain, by the way, according to the witnesses. In Britain, he would never raise his voice because British people are very sensitive to that. But you see, did you know that in the Church of God, the women, ladies, spokes and clubs were allowed in Britain, but not in America? You may wonder why. Well, because of, again, cultural sensitivity. Feminism and feminist movement was very strong in America. And the tendency for feminist ideas to influence our ladies in the church was far greater than when it was in Europe, so the ladies' clubs were not allowed in America. You might say wisdom. Yes, indeed, it's a wisdom. But I'm telling you all this wisdom, brethren, because we have to be wise to discern the spirits. We have to be wise to understand the times in which we live, and we have to be wise to understand the tremendous pressure under which we're going to find ourselves sooner or later. Some of you already told me you're under pressure. You don't have to tell me, because I know it. Our friend from Norway has often told me how many times people are trying to to, to, to convince him to give up on the, on the, on the commandments of God. <laughs> but he always tells me, no, I don't fear anybody. I fear only God. I'm going to serve God of Israel. He is the only God creator. Isn't that true? Yes, I say to him, it's true. And his attitude is right. He only has pressure. We all have various levels of pressures, and it might increase. We need to be ready for that, because this time there will be increase under the influence of Satan directly, because Satan is going to corroborate that pressure by inspiring possibly somebody like Simon Magus to perform all of these false, terrible miracles. Reading from Irenaeus, Simon suspected that even this was done, the laying on of hands of the Holy Spirit, through a kind of greater knowledge of magic. Offering money to the apostles, Simon thought he too might receive this power of bestowing the Holy Spirit on whomsoever he would, and was addressed in these words by Peter, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither nor part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity, brethren, again. That was the prophecy, one of the most important in your Bible. The Peter actually prophesied, I see that you're going to be poisoned by bitterness, Christianity, and that you are going to poison it by iniquity. And sure enough, Simon Magus introduced what? Idolatry into the church. And so did his followers. The idolatry that has been prevalent all over the place, in all various churches, Protestant, not so much, but Catholic and Orthodox churches. But even the Protestants have got their own gods, their own pastors, that were, which they worship as gods. Speaking of Guatemala, I remember that was one incident. We were getting ready for the Feast of Unleavened Bread at the 11 in the home, whatever, in one of the homes of our members. Plenty of young people, myself and so on, and uh, it was Sunday. I guess we were even getting ready for the even for the Passover anyway. Knock, knock on the door. Can I just open the door? I was just curious. 
and it was an opportunity to practice my Spanish, which used to be much better than now, certainly. Oh, a man said, uh, would, you like, uh, would you like to speak a little bit about the Word of God? La Palabra de Dios in Spanish. I said, I thought, well, why not? Let's witness to him. So I said, fine. I got him in my host, told me later, Arthur. Arthur told me that he uh, never would allow people like that to have uh, these, kinds of, these kinds of discussions. And I do agree with him. That's fine. But for some reason I just felt perhaps it would be a good exercise for us to see our faith. And of course, we started, he started, the man started about the grace, what else did he do? A grace, whatever, grace, you know, grace, that we are free from law, whatever. And I remember I was so, you might say I was so mean. Yeah, sure enough, I, I, I do accept that I'm imperfect, Bedwin. But uh, every time he would say something about grace against the law, I would just quote the Apostle John, and in Spanish, I would just shout out, and his commandments, and then the rest of the crowd in the house would say, are not burdensome <laughs> in Spanish. Now we just shout Sus mandamientos and then the rest would say Are no son gravosos and that was it. We were trying to tell this man that in the New Testament God's commandments are not uh, burdensome and their command they were equally under the law and under the grace. By the way today I mentioned that as well. Because I was reading a, a verse in Romans 6.14 to the Serbian congregation, brethren, please. The verse says you're not under the law, meaning under the curse of the law, meaning under the death penalty of the law, but you're under grace. That's what it means in, the, in, in, in Romans 6.14. But lest somebody would misunderstand it in Serbian, I mentioned something that you need to keep in mind as well. Brethren, we are both under the both the law and grace. Does that make sense? It should. In one letter that I recently found out from Mr. Armstrong, he scolds all of us in the past for just mentioning keeping the law, obeying the law, the law, the law, the law. But he says, but you never mentioned the grace. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ and grace is also part of the equation. So it's true. And therefore, brethren, we are both under the law and the grace. Yes, under both. Keep that in mind as well. And don't be, don't be easily deceived by all these false Christian preachers all over the world. Uh, he then continues Irenaeus against uh, the uh, speaking against Simon Magus, not putting faith in God at all, set himself eagerly to contend against the apostles, in order that he himself might seem to be a wonderful being. He applied himself with still greater zeal to the study of the whole magic art, that he might the better bewilder and overpower multitudes of men. Such was his procedure in the reign of Claudius Caesar, by whom also he was honored with a statue on account of his magical power. Many then glorified this man as if he were a god, and he taught that it was himself who appeared among the Jews as the son, but descended in Samaria as the father, while he came to other nations in the character of the Holy Spirit. He represented himself, in a word, as being the loftiest of all powers, that is, the being who is the father over all, and he allowed himself to be called by whatsoever title men were pleased to address him. Oh, indeed. And what about his followers today? Are they enjoying being called Father, the Holy Father? Yes, of course, Bethany. And by all these other various titles. The question was, how could Simon, Simon Magus do this? To get an idea of how far Egyptian-trained magicians could go, it is worthwhile that you, brethren, examine the encounter between Janus and Jambres and Moses. In their first encounter, Aaron's staff turned into a snake. You might remember that in Exodus chapter 7. Pharaoh called then in Janus and Jambres, and they turned their staffs into snakes, also using their secret arts. Aaron's staff, snake, then swallowed those of Janus and Jambres. It's all in Exodus chapter 7, verse 9 through 12. But Pharaoh's heart, as you know, brethren, had hardened, 
and he wouldn't listen to Moses and Aaron, and thus began the ten plagues. James and Jambres were able to duplicate the first two plagues, but not the third and the rest of the plagues. They reported to Pharaoh that the third and following plagues was the finger of God, Exodus 8, verse 19. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing, brethren, how many times in the Bible do we find that even those magicians cannot do anything or they can recognize where is the finger of God. Remember Balaam, Balaam who was supposed to curse Israel, he could not. At the end, he had to proclaim the blessings of God Israel. But yet we read about Balaamites in the New Testament, don't we? We read about those who eat sacrifices given to the idols in the book in the church of Thyatira. We read about various people opposing within the work of God, the work of God itself. Well, I'm alluding to tell you, brethren, there's our old references to the Simon Magus and his followers. But we need to know that. Because the church that Simon Magus founded is still well and alive. Kicking it alive even today. And it's the two-horned beast. Two horns representing its secular and its ecclesiastical powers. There is no such an entity on the face of the earth. As Vatican State, rather. The smallest state in the world. By the way, by the way, just to remind you of something that people forget or look over. Vatican City, Vatican as an entity for a long time was opposed to the Italian kings and Italian sovereigns because of the claim of the land. The Vatican wanted the whole Italy to be belonging to Vatican. <laughs> and I think even the, uh, uh, yes, all Italians. This is a concept now strange to you because you live in your civil society, but all the Italians automatically, when they're born, they're considered to be Catholics. And this is nothing new in Europe, brethren. You have all, you have nationhood equalizes religious affiliation. Now it's strange to all of you in America and everywhere else and to all the Protestant world, but that's the case in Europe, you see. So all the Italians who are born are automatically considered Catholics. All the Serbs who are born are automatically considered to be Orthodox. So are all the Russians. So are all the Ukrainians. Uh, all the Catholics, all the Spaniards being born are automatically considered to be uh, Catholics. That's Europe, brethren. You might say, well, it's imposing. Yes, it is imposing. That's why it is the beast. No other continent in the world is called the beast but Europe. It's bestial. It's the beast. He doesn't respect freedom. He doesn't care about freedom. He doesn't care about religious freedom. The whole purpose of the Catholic Church is to subdue, subdue the whole world, brethren, to be papal servants. That's why they have the Jesuit order. That's why they have all these various orders. That's the whole purpose of their existence. To subdue the world to Pope. Don't you get it, brethren? That's why Europe is the beast. No, it's not Turkey. No, it's not Jordan. It's not Canada. It's not United States. It's not Mexico. It's Europe. Has been, always been. Beast, yes. With bestial church hierarchy in Rome. With bestial governments. Capable of envisioning something as horrible, gruesome, and terrible as Inquisition. And by the way, the other last Sabbath, I was just, I was just irked to mention this. Iron Maiden, the famous, famous, horrible rock band. Well, I mentioned to the Serbian public how my brother, one Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m., all of a sudden there was this terrible noise coming from his room. He let this play on this Iron Maiden. Now, those of you younger ones, we live now in the Google age. Would you please go to Google and Google out what is Iron Maiden? I'm thinking, I'm telling you all of this because somebody might hear this who is not in the Church of God and might be fan of that terrible, awful band. Iron Maiden is a, is a torture mechanism of inquisition. That's how those 
deceived people in England named their band Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden is a horrible thing. Google it out. And don't you ever allow yourself to listen to that. And you all adult, one, adult ones, tell your children what it is. And tell your children what is the name and why is the name of that band. And tell your children to go and Google it out. You have to find out, brethren, if history is going to repeat itself. In the Great Tribulation, it will be worse than even Inquisition. That's how dumb we are today. We have these smartphones all over the place. The whole world is full with smartphones. You go to the deepest countryside of Africa, everybody has got smart application. What's up? Uh, this, that, and the other. Smartphones. I haven't seen it. Many of them are, at least when it comes to the Church of God, are using that for the glory of God and to be connected with their brethren, but that's another story. But that's another story. We have this, we have these smartphones all over the place and dumb people who do not discern the spirits. Go and Google what is Iron Maiden. And those of you who listen to that or want to listen to that or want to read any stupidity like that, you'll be bringing curses upon yourselves. Because Iron Maiden is a horrible torture mechanism from the Inquisition. And it was invented, yes, in Europe, brethren. That's why Europe is the beast. And don't listen to this stupidity. Turkey is the beast. And Islamic world is the beast. No, it is not. Islam was invented later. At the time when John the Apostle was writing Revelation, the book of, the book of Revelation, the Church of Rome was there in existence. So was the Roman Empire. He was writing about existing entities, not about Islam and Turkey. However horrible the regime of Turkey might be, it's not the beast. But sadly, many of these messianic groups are coming up with this. Edom, Turkey, beast, beast. They live in deception, brethren. We cannot allow ourselves to live in deception. If we do, then, you know, various deceptive ideas are going to be pushing you left and right, away from God. And God is going to, you know, then let us, he's not going to prevent us from being pushed by Satan left and right, and then we can just drift away more and more. Anyway, Pharaoh's heart had hardened and he wouldn't let Israel go, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, and thus began the ten plagues. And then the finger of God is there, they reported to Pharaoh, he is magicians. But Pharaoh wouldn't listen. Here's another, uh, another historical quote from Athanasius of Alexandria, one of those church commentators, let's call him that way. He was from his book on the incarnation of the word, uh, chapter 11, page 6 and 7. He says, magic arts were taught among them and oracles in diverse places led men astray and all men ascribed the influences of their birth and existence to the stars having no thought of anything beyond what was visible. Brethren, I've been, I don't know, for, 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 for Sabbaths now, Sabbath in, Sabbath out, I've been raving on in Serbian against horoscopes and, and astrology and horoscopes and stuff because some people in this nation these Gentile nations start their, their day by, let's review what does the horoscope tell us will happen to us today. The stupidity of this bestial Europe is to such an extent, baby, that we even had horoscope for the New Year's Eve. Would you believe that? And then they have horoscopes for each zodiac. What is going to be economic status of Zodiac, love status of Zodiac throughout this year? Would you believe that and our stupid, idiotic press is flooding us with articles like that? Brethren, it's horrible psychological pressure on me. It's terrible pressure even on the, the believers here. But I have to keep raising my voice and tell people to abstain and keep away from those occult, satanic traps. As much as I've been raising my voice about Santa Claus, 
And what a horrible Greek deity that is. And some people wonder, well, what is the big deal? Well, it is, it is a big deal. We cannot be Christians and promoting in our belief system, in our homes, promoting the image of disgusting, awful Greek deity. We cannot be promoting the, the horoscopes and, 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 and saying, well, it's just a fun, you know. No, it's not. It's Satan's trap. But could you believe to what, to what idiotism our society has descended into when you have a horror, when you have <laughs> a newspaper article saying horoscope for the New Year's Eve? Could you believe that I couldn't believe my eyes? But Brennan, this is 21st century, supposedly, uh, technological and other advances. But the human evil nature hasn't advanced one single bit. It's getting worse. And you can see that also from the conflict here in East Europe between Ukraine and Russia. Two siblings. Oh no, 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 no. Do not listen to your, to your uh, a biased press. Oh, poor Ukrainians and, you know, the Russians are all evil. No, stop that stupidity right away. This war was provoked by the Ukrainian regime, by the way. It was bombing and murdering ethnic Russians within Ukraine. I'm sorry that your Western press didn't tell you that, but that's the case. Nevertheless, now we, for months, now for a whole year, we've been watching this Almost the whole year. It'll be February now, the whole year. We will watch this tragedy. Deprivation of human nature. We'll be watching people, you know, killing each other's energetic uh, capabilities. Killing one another. Competing who is better. Brethren, do not be deceived. Russians are superior. That's the fact. I'm sorry if that's the bad news for any of you, but that's the fact. They're superior and it was... Obvious from the very start that they're superior. And it was obvious to me, I told you from the very beginning, brethren, Ukraine stands no chance. No chance because Russians are Russians. And those of us who live in Europe know that very well. Those of us who are of Slavic origin, we know that very well. And in vain, all of this, all of this, all of this uh, military help and the aid coming from West, brethren, it will not work. It will only be worse for the Ukrainians. The best that the Ukraine could have done was to basically capitulate and rescue what could be rescued. And then we wouldn't be seeing rubbles all over the place. And you might remember the, the, the poor city of Mariupol that I mentioned so many times last, last year. My heart was grieving to see a beautiful port, vibrant port being destroyed being destroyed because the neo-Nazis were there. Not Russian, by the way, but Ukrainian neo-Nazis, nevertheless. Horrible things have been happening in Ukraine. Who knows what else are we going to find out? But brethren, the fact is that the human nature has not changed. Human nature has remained deprived, deceitful, sick above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Laments Jeremiah. And that same nature is within all of us still alive. Battling now with the Holy Spirit now, of course. But the pressure on us will be great. And our nature will tend to try to deceive us, to get us into majority camp, to tell us that, to mesmerize us with miracles, numbers, whatever you name it. Pharaoh wouldn't listen. And God alone, says Arrhenius, and his word was unknown, albeit he had not hidden himself out of man's sight, but had unfolded the knowledge of himself to them in many forms and many ways. End of the quote. And even though James and Jambres recognized the Lord as a power beyond their secret arts, they did not repent and they did not wish to serve the Lord. Brethren, I'm telling you this as a warning. It is pre-Passover service. Ser- a sermon and pre-Passover time. There might be people who do not want to repent of their cultures, people who just take pride of their stupid things thinking that their culture is something superior. 
And no, I'm not going to apologize for saying this. It is irresponsible to have a bunch of children and not wonder, not wonder how are they going to grow up, whether they'll have their privacy as they grow up from, with different genders and whether you'll have enough money and whatever to feed them, brethren. And no, I'm not going to apologize because I'm, 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 I'm fed up with even those who say, but that's spontaneous. Isn't that lovely? No, it is not. No, it is not. God expects people to plan their family. When two people decide to produce a child, it's God-given design. Yes, I recognize that. And yes, I recognize that's something that God has created in humans. But one thing is to rec- one thing is to be responsible to plan your family and number of your children, and the other thing is just to have keep you know giving birth to your children that can be living in muds without without sufficient food, with terrible education, with you name it. You name it. Uh. And I'm so happy myself not to have the children because I'm looking at this. I'm looking just the educational system. This is horrendous. And by the way, no, we don't have homeschooling in Europe. Do you realize that? No, you don't, of course, because you think that the whole world is centered under the Anglo-Saxon values. Wrong. Terribly wrong. There is no homeschooling in our countries. And the public schools are just as terrible as they are in the United States and elsewhere, with all of this supposedly those values. And there is no way you can extract your child from it. And you have even problem. No, there is no even excuse, feast excuse forms like you have in your countries. No, we don't have it. Nobody cares about the Feast of Tabernacles. Nobody cares about your freedom of religion. This is beast. This is Europe. The best deal continent. Get it. Once and for all. And I'm glad I don't have children. Because I would have to put up with this horrible education system. We do have some prospective members with children. I feel sorry for them. Because the pressure, psychological and societal pressure they'll be feeling, they'll be having to endure those poor parents, is horrendous. You have to send your children to those schools that teach them all kinds of stupidities. Paganism. False religion. Religious instructions when one of, my, one of my cousin's daughters tells me, when she tells me what she was taught, I, I spent the whole afternoon telling the, 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 the girl, she's now in her teenage uh, uh, age, telling the girl, you know what, about the origin of, 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 of religion, about the Nimrod, about Babylon, about Simon Magus, because nobody teaches them in the religious instruction. And religious instruction is now obligatory, either that or you have so-called uh, civil, uh, civil, uh, civil rules, whatever they call it anyway. So people just opt for one or the other. Many opt, of course, for religious instruction because this was an atheist country, this was a socialist country, and nobody cared about religion. So they're trying to get, go back to their roots. And today I've just recorded two or three programs about the Christmas... Eve and Christmas customs in Serbian nation. You would not believe, brethren, what kind of superstitions, what kind of paganism is there. You do not believe. You probably think that your customs of Christmas are the worst of all. Well, you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe what the rituals people in this country, in this nation, and uh, across the nation are doing every Christmas Eve. You wouldn't believe. One of these days I might try to sum it all up for you just to illustrate to you the level of paganism in which we live. And yet people think those are holy things. People think they are the Christian things. People think there's something to be done because otherwise God is going to punish you terribly. Anyway, Simon Magus was using the demonic arts to deceive people, brethren. And I was going to speak, yes, I spoke about the, began to speak about culture. Ha ha ha, you know, there was this, there was this kind of, ha 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 ha, you people in Europe have one or two children, ha 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 ha, here we have, because here in their continent it's a, it's a prestige, it is a title of prestige to have a, 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 a squad of children, it doesn't matter. 
how they're going to grow up. It doesn't matter. They'll be what they're going to eat, whatever. You know. Brethren, that's horrendous. And don't, don't, don't tell me any, any culture. Don't tell me any culture superior than the others. All the cultures are influenced one way or another by Satan, the devil anyway. You know, in the church, it used to be in the past, obviously, implied that we all are supposed to become Americanized. Forget about it. Forget about it. I cannot be an American. I wasn't born in that culture. I wasn't grew up. I didn't grow up there. Just as many of you cannot be Serbians, many of us cannot be Mexicans. We can just respect all those countries, of course, and all those nationalities, of course. We can just take wonderful foods from there. We can take even wonderful customs from all those nations. That's fine. But rather, we cannot pretend to be something that we are not. The church is not to be the melting pot. The church is not to make to make out of us something that we are not. After all, God created all the nationalities, and therefore you are all obligated to respect them, brethren. Out of all nations and tongues and tribes, God said he'll call his people. Fine. If he created that difference, who am I and who are you or anybody else who tried to? But there were people just obsessed with that. Even at the college, you know. I had to constantly battle this, 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 this backlash of Americanization, you know. Because supposedly, whatever America does, whatever America says, whatever American president proclaims, that's supreme in the world. Nobody knows better. That's why I love my history teacher, Michael Carter. Brilliant man. Brilliant man never displayed any of those stupid things. Always taught us the real things. Try to make history to be fun. Never caught us, never trying to catch us in, 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 in something we don't know. Was always trying to enforce something that we do know. Brethren, among other things, I'm a good speaker because of that person. Because he set a wonderful example to me. I thought history was just a dead, dead letter that is worth nothing for our human lives because we live today, not yesterday. I was terribly wrong. That man has shown me, has proven to me, that history is not a dead letter. It's a live matter, brethren. It's a live matter that repeats itself. And it keeps repeating itself. Oh, yes. We've seen that on the Balkan Peninsula. We've seen hatreds, inter-ethnic hatreds that we have not experienced since the Second World War. We're seeing now this terrible conflict in Ukraine. And again, I'm telling you, it's terrible to aid any side there. It's terrible, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you what is the truth that people don't want to hear, it, but it's true. Russians are superior in many ways, not only to Ukrainians, but to other European nations as well. If nothing else, Russians do not allow GMO rubbish on their soil. Unlike Britain, that is completely devastated and polluted by GMO seed all over the place. How terrible! Not to mention other things. And plus it's the mindset of Russians that's something that you just, you cannot conquer them. Hitler tried, Napoleon tried, the Ukrainians are trying, brethren, it's not going to happen. Because Russians are Russians. And I'm sorry for those who may not want to hear that, but that's the fact. And I feel sorry. I feel sorry for Ukrainians, of course I do. As much as I do feel sorry for Russians and for all those Russians who were fell victims of Ukrainians. But brethren, we have to understand in every war there is no one one side that is innocent and the other side is so guilty. Certainly not. Do not be naive to believe that, brethren, because it's irrational. And I'm afraid as time goes on, it seems sometimes in the Church of God, brethren, that we are suffering from some kind of lack of lack of common sense. And you know, there is this horrible prophecy, Leviticus 26, referring to the house of Israel. God is going to strike you with madness, he says. And sometimes you stop and think, yeah, sadly. Yeah, sadly, brethren. People just get mixed up. They get, they cannot even use common sense anymore about things. You present to them all the facts. For example, how Easter is pagan and stuff. But no, they can't make the dots connect. You tell them about the peace deal 
from Daniel chapter 9. They read about uh, United Arab Emirates and Israel, the state of Israel, signing up peace accords and, and diplomatic relations. And they wonder, oh, is this the peace deal? Ah, oh, no, it's not. Because the peace deal has to come when first before there is a nuclear regional war in the Middle East. Can we get that? First comes the nuclear war, which will devastate Jerusalem and will devastate most likely li, 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 the, the capital of Syria, Damascus, and Tehran. And then Europe has to send its envoy, its peacekeeping envoy. He is the one, European envoy, not United Arab Emirates, not the State of Israel, not, you name it, is the European envoy, whoever he will be. I suspect it will be Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, and if it's not him, I'll publicly apologize to all of you because I, and I said to Bob Till, I spoke to Bob Till about a week ago, I said, uh, again, I said, you cannot dissuade me that it is not him because I cannot see the better candidate for that office. But fine, if it's not him, I'm not perfect. I'm going to apologize to the rest of the world. But whoever it will be, brethren, he is the one to sign the peace deal in the Middle East. It's European envoy. It's not Emirates. It's not Egypt. It's not Ethiopia. It's not Somalia. It's not Turkey. It's not Erdogan. It's the European envoy. Can we get it? And stop being confused about things. But I'm afraid, yes, it says, I'll strike with madness. I wonder sometimes in the church of God, where is the common sense? Even when it comes to understanding the prophecies. So please get it. Peace deal is going to be signed by European envoy of German origin who will be sent to the Middle East to end the regional Middle Eastern war. Period. Don't be confused about Abraham Accords. Don't be confused about uh, uh, Saudi Arabia probably will most likely sign peace deal with Israel very soon. But that's not the peace deal, brethren. Don't be confused. And let's finish today with just to remind you once again, Pharaoh wouldn't listen. Plague events, plague events that happened in Egypt with those two magicians. Initial meeting, staff became snake, Aaron's staff. Uh, with those two magicians, they also made their staff became snake. First plague came, Nile became blood. Those two magicians also made Nile to become blood. Second plague was frogs came, and of course, those magicians made frogs came. But the third plague, dust became gnats. <laughs> In Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, well, they could not duplicate that anymore. The fourth plague was insect swarms. The fifth one, pestilence on livestock. The sixth one was soot became skin boils. And magicians got boils also, brethren. Seventh one, thunder, hail, and fire. Eighth plague, locusts. Ninth plague, thick darkness for three days. And tenth plague, the firstborn of Egypt were murdered. Simon had a moment of recognition similar to James and Jambres when he saw the miracles performed by Philip and the giving of the Holy Spirit by Peter and John in Acts chapter 8. Simon believed, it says in in Acts chapter 8 verse 13, he believed, but his heart was not right in the sight of God. Brethren, that had happened to any of us if we don't repent and if we, we don't have a repented attitude. Because he was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity, as the Apostle Peter pronounced in Acts chapter 8 verse 23. He simply did not wish to serve the Lord. Brethren, this pre Passover time, I'm going to be using this Simon Magus, his perverted character, to be warning to all of us. Because there are people who do not want to, want to serve the Lord, but they want to serve themselves. And they're using religion as an excuse to serve themselves. And that's something that we need to be aware before, before hopefully this Passover. Hopefully that will be my, my warning, my thrust, and my approach. And in the, all of that, in, in all of those endeavors, hopefully you'll be learning something from the church history. And hopefully, brethren, you will be, you'll be, you'll be hopefully understanding more and more that Simon Magus and his followers are extant in the New Testament. They're 
They are just mentioned everywhere in the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation, and, and, they will be there to the very end. To the very end, brethren, they will be there, but we must be prepared for the pressure. We are not competing with those churches. We are there, and we are enduring their false teachings and stuff so that we will be building God-like, Christ-like character. And if anything I expected when I came into a church organization that later included me even into the forum, I mentioned I will not mention forum, I, I promised once, but I have to do if one thing that I was hoping to see in our conversations come up, in our whatever would be the word Christ-like, God-like character. Over these past several years, the, 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 the two words that I could name that I would least hear in the Church of God would be fasting and the second one, character. Brethren, have we forgotten that we have to allow Holy Spirit to build in us immutable, unchangeable, eternal, holy, righteous, perfect character? Mr. Armstrong, if you would take his writings, his, his, his booklets, his articles, if you would just detect the word character, especially with the holy, perfect, righteous, you would probably find tons of References to that. What is, has happened to us? The word character is not even mentioned. The word character I don't hear very often. What about pray? I'm living, I said to some people, I'm just living for certain church areas to hear that a church area proclaimed a church area fast because of you name it. Flood, hunger, uh, whatever. Brethren, it seems to me that so much of irresponsibility, lack, lack of responsibilities, lax attitude has been crept in our midst that we don't even be, are not able to discern certain things and sometimes our common sense seems to be failing. I might be wrong, may I be wrong in my assessment of that, but I've been, I've been seeing too many Red flags and warning signs that I cannot speak about this. And again, I'll be using now Simon Magus as a character, as a false teacher, as a possible precursor of the false prophet, and as a perverted character to illustrate to you the need for us Christians to watch over our spiritual state of being, state of mind, to use common sense being inspired by the Holy Spirit, And I'll be using Simon Vegas to warn us, brethren, of the need that we have to rely on God. So many people are already doing it, relying on the gods of this world. You wouldn't believe how many magic rituals and magic rites are there, even in the nominal Christianity of Serbian Orthodoxy. Brethren, you wouldn't believe. And it's all practiced on Christmas. And people believe that it is Christian that it is God-inspired, that it is something that they have to do, otherwise something horrible will happen. Brethren, you don't get it. And I don't, don't expect you to get it, but I've been, over the last 20, 30 years, collecting various literatures, pieces of literatures, written by the Serbian people, in which they analyzed, analyzed all of those various rites. So I've been presenting this today, and these days, in, in about four installments, I've got... Uh, Christmas and Christmas Eve customs of the Serbian nation presented to them. Re I read them from the Serbian sources, from the Serbian authors, so that they wouldn't say, oh, it must be some foreign satanization, demonization of Serbian people, because yes, there is, uh, Western media is very much, very much prone to demonizing Serbian people. Anyway, that's another story. However, I've been using to show to them, I've been using Serbian authors to show to them what kind of demonic magic rituals are they doing hoping to see prosperity of their fields prosperity of their flock prosperity of their family and 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 uh, uh, fertility that's the word fertility in you wouldn't believe brethren 
there are no literature like that in your in, in your languages, so that's what you cannot cannot really understand. But I've been I've been I've been forced this year, for the first time, as I'm a Christian, to tell this nation its sins straight to their face and to quote it from the Serbian sources. Brethren, I feel we're getting closer to the end. I may not, perhaps I'm wrong in some of my assessments, but brethren, I have to warn you, I'm afraid that we are becoming lax in some things. I'm afraid that we are just lacking some common sense sometimes. And I took as an example the uh, Abraham Accord and the peace deal and so on and so forth. And I feel it's my duty to warn you about that. So that we can stay faithful to God and that we can, that we can, uh, remain and make it into the kingdom. And yes, we have many trials because we're Christians and because of those trials, we are going to be, we have to be, we have to have the holy, perfect, righteous character built in us. Without that, none of us will make it into the kingdom.